Now everybody, let me tell you a story about Hollywood shame With terrible actors and scripts collide Oh what a mess it is on the other side Saw the lights, camera action begin But all I got was a movie that plunged in a spin From the first scene to the credits that roll oh, Taking its toll Silver screen says full That movies galore Can't help but wonder what the hell Were they making these for Throwing some cliches A sharp and predictable plot It's a train wreck I tell you it's all they ever And now for our feature presentation. Welcome to the Silver Screen Cesspool, where we review the poo. Ooh. And now your host, the surveyor of <laughs> cinema, the mocker of moronic movies, the terror of Tiny Town, the last known survivor of Battlefield Earth, the one of many, Alan Smith E. Sigh. Where do I begin with this stinker? National Treasure is a film that attempts to break new ground in that, to date, great treasure hunting movies have not been set within the borders of the United States. There is, however, a reason for this. America is only slightly under 250 years old, and that's hardly enough time to develop any sort of historical mythos to make a lost fortune really lost. 250 years is more of the time it takes for a national treasure to be misplaced? It wouldn't be wildly thrilling for Indiana Jones to be cavorting around New Jersey hunting for a gold statue. Lara Croft would never roam the Great Plains searching for the lost fortunes of a bunch of Great Plains settlers. Nevertheless, National Treasure plows forward. The movie starts in a flashback with our hero, Benjamin Franklin Gates, as a child, being told the story of the family legacy, that of this hidden treasure. That's a serial killer name, by the way. Benjamin Franklin Gates. Anyway, then we have a flashback within the flashback, which I'm sure violates some law of the space-time continuum. But in this flashback, this is where the movie starts to go wrong. The entire movie concept fails the simple logic test. The treasure, as the story goes, was first discovered by six knights during the Crusades, who, upon realizing the great fortune of the treasure, decided it was too much for any one person to have, as that amount of riches would make one person much too powerful. So they decide to move it and hide it for all eternity, thus forming an alliance that would one day become the Masons. Not to be confused with the stonecutters from The Simpsons. Okay, let's pause for a moment and think. Six knights discovered the treasure and decided together, all six of them, that the treasure was much too much for one person. Now, I'm not a math genius here, but I might split it between the six of them. It's called division. We learned about it in third grade. Hello? Anyway, so the treasurer reappears and disappears throughout history. Every time it appears, it gets added to two, and then it disappears again. Always rehidden by the Masons. This happens mainly to give the treasure some long history since America has a short history, and this story needed the added credibility. Eventually, in colonial times, the treasure made its way to America. Yes, this massive treasure, too much for one person, somehow made it across the Atlantic Ocean in leaky wooden boats, undetected and unstolen during time of war. As fate would have it, many of America's founding fathers were Masons, so they decided to hide the treasure in their spare time between planning the country's framework and fighting the Revolutionary War. Never mind that the colonial army couldn't afford real guns, uniforms, clothing, food, and other basic military necessities. We're burying that treasure by gum and saving it for a rainy day. Just in case. 
Grandpa tells the young lad he knows this because his grandpa's grandpa was the stable boy for the last living signer of the Declaration of Independence, and he told him about it on his deathbed. Yes, several hundred years of strict, cult-like secrecy were revealed to the nearest stable boy. But unfortunately, he neglected to share anything more than he needed to to look for the treasure, but he needed to look for something named Charlotte. Dad, played by Jean Voigt, hears Grandpa telling the story and gets mad because he doesn't want his son wasting his life like he did, or his dad did. Perhaps it's just my opinion, but if you donated your DNA to creating Angelina Jolie, that is not a life wasted. But anyway, we're five minutes into the movie, and I'm already annoyed by the plot. So fast forward to the present. A grown-up Ben Gates, played by Nick Cage. Yes, I know him well enough to call him Nick. Do you? The guy who played Alec, the good spy turned bad in the movie Goldeneye, and a bunch of flunkies are playing around on a set left over from the movie Day After Tomorrow. They hop out of their arctic crawlers and dig in the snow. Wouldn't you know it, the first place they dig, they find a copy of the book Charlotte's Web. Actually, that would have been slightly more believable than what happened, but they found the nameplate on a ship named Charlotte. Not the mast, not the stern, not the poop deck, not the iron cannons or anything else. As soon as they dig in a vast Arctic wasteland, they find the nameplate. Because apparently that nameplate had a lot of flair to it. Woo! So they get on board the Charlotte and there's no treasure. It's not surprising since it's the movie's first ten minutes though. However, they do find a pipe, which Nick breaks to find another clue that tells them to steal the Declaration of Independence. Because an invisible map is on the back. Alec ponders momentarily and declares, That makes perfect sense. They wanted to make sure the map was hidden, but on something important enough that it would be saved and protected forever and ever. To my surprise, that explanation actually makes sense, but it's the kind of mistake they won't make again in this movie. But Alec isn't a good guy, surprise. He's a secret bad guy, surprise. It's like Goldeneye all over again. He will steal the declaration, and the only way Nick can stop it is to steal it first. I'm not even going to go into how craptastic the whole breaking and entering and stealing the declaration sequence is. But in a nutshell, Nick and his sidekick break in, battle the baddies, get the declaration, and have the hot love interest slash official declaration historian tag along as they drive to daddy's to try and make the invisible map visible again with the baddies and the feds hot on their trail. They make the map visible again and it's not a map. It's another riddle and another code. Oh my gosh. The riddle tells them that the code indicates specific letters located in a particular lines on specific pages in letters to the newspaper editor that Ben Franklin wrote when he was 13. Okay, this clue killed the movie for me completely. Nail in coffin. Dead. For four reasons. The first... The Founding Fathers had the foresight to know that the Declaration of Independence was the most essential document of their time and would be saved forever. Coming in a close second as most important document was letters to the editor by a catfishing 13-year-old Ben Franklin. Not the Constitution, not the Bill of Rights, not Common Sense, not the Articles of Frickin' Confederation. Letters to the frickin' editor by a 13-year-old Ben frickin' Franklin. Second, by a strange coincidence, the original letters were at one time held by a private collector who had no idea they were tied to the national treasure, even though he wasted his life looking for the national treasure. Yes, you guessed it, dear old dad was the proud owner of these letters for a while. Of course, he gave them to a museum in Philadelphia, so Nick couldn't look at them immediately. So our hero, his sidekick, and the girl do the next logical thing. They leave Washington, D.C. and head to Philly to look at the letters firsthand with the baddies close behind. Soon after, the feds show up at Dad's house to figure out what's going on and look up what the letters say on the internet. Yes, Nick Cage went to Philly and the feds used the Google. Nick is a dumbass. 
Fourth and finally, they figure out the code, and it tells them to look at where the shadow of the steeple of the Freedom Hall points at exactly 2.30 for the next clue. Sadly, Nick checks his watch at 2.45. Oh no, they'll have to wait till tomorrow! But then the sidekick remembers that in 1776, there was no daylight savings time, so they still had 45 minutes to get there. So they're compensating for daylight savings time, but not the tilt of the earth that comes with the changing seasons. I will admit that in the movie, being pointed to a general area would have worked, but then why mention slash compensate for daylight savings time at all? This is not to say that their adjustment of daylight savings times completely wouldn't have worked anyway, because in 1776 there was no way to standardize time, and time was, at best, a localized guesstimate. I'm, I'm done with this movie. I, I can't go on. That's a mere half of this movie. From this point out, the plot is so convoluted, I could barely follow it, let alone explain it to somebody. I simply can't stomach that they want us to believe that Ben Franklin drew an invisible map on the back of the Declaration of Independence, moved and hid a kajillion dollar treasure and clues to find it all over colonial America by horse. In his spare time, between founding the country, inventing bipocals, and discovering electricity, writing an almanac, being ambassador to France, and all the other crap he did. Ben Franklin was too freaking brilliant to come up with such lame-ass clues. Period. You can incorporate all the science and history into a movie like this, or you can completely ignore it on the most surface level, but sprinkling in just enough to point out the flaws in the movie does not work. The movie is Ernest Saves the Da Vinci Code, but not quite that smart. The movie is crapadelic. I have no idea how this movie spawned two sequels and a TV series. Its plot holes are more significant than those of the Titanic. Both the movie plot and the actual ship. There is no believability that this could actually happen. It shouldn't surprise you that the other writing credit of the writer of this movie includes the Cuba Gooding slash talking dog flick Snow Dogs. That said, however, I can offer one suggestion to improve the movie. At the end of the film, when they are in the cavern with the gold statues and the gold coins and all the other various gold treasures, one of them should reach out, touch a statue, and exclaim, This isn't real gold. It's just gold foil. And inside is rich, dark milk chocolate. This is even better than I imagined. Yes, I realize that makes no sense, but neither does the rest of the movie. National Treasure is available streaming on Disney. Silver Screen Cesspool is written, directed, and starring Alan Smithy. Assistant director, producer, and stunt coordinator, Alan Smithy. Boom mic operator, sound editing, and music by Alan Smithy. Construction coordinator, The Amazing Rando. Makeup by Crayola. Catering was provided by the Soylent Corporation. Alan Smithy will be back in Return of the Curse of the Planet of the Prehistoric Bikini Ninjas versus Kingdom of the Bride of the Killer, Shark Cheerleaders 2, Electric Boogaloo.